The last video I uploaded was pretty heavy, so let's do something fun in this one. We tend to call people or animals colorblind when they don't see color quite the same way that the average person does. But colorblind is a bit of a misnomer because it's not that they can't see color, it's just that it's different for them. And let's talk about that and other vision stuff for a couple animals. This video made possible thanks to the continuing support of viewers, patrons, and PayPal pals like you. Thanks! Hi! Welcome back to the channel! To start, let's quickly revisit how we perceive color. The how was more thoroughly explored in a previous video, so feel free to check that out. At the back of our eyes, in a structure called the retina, we have light-sensitive cells called photoreceptors. And there's two forms of photoreceptors, rods and cones. Rods support our peripheral and dimmer light vision, but not really color vision, but they are more sensitive to motion. Cones support our central vision in average light conditions. They're also what allow us to see color. This is because we have three types of cones. One type is most sensitive to the shorter wavelengths of visible light, which puts it in the bluish region. In the biz, these are referred to as S cones. One type is most sensitive to the middle wavelengths, which is in the greenish region, and are imaginatively called the M cones. And the last is most sensitive to slightly longer wavelengths than the middle, which puts it a little bit more towards the red, and as such are called the L cones. If you don't have these three cone types with these sensitivities, your color vision will differ from people who do. The average person is just called a trichromat. If a person has all three cone types and at least one of those cone sensitivities is shifted a little bit, that person is called an anomalous trichromat. Trichromat because the person still has vision built on three cone types, but anomalous because it's different from the norm. But when someone is called colorblind, they're typically a dichromat or more rarely a monochromat. A dichromat only has two cone types, while a monochromat is either working with only one cone type or has no cones at all. Note for a future video. Photoreceptors, so the rods and the cones, have a pigment in them that absorb the light. It's how they work. And so people who are missing pigment, so people with albinism, will also be missing the pigment in their photoreceptors. And there's many processes through which this happens, but they tend to have problems with their vision, and this is why. Anyways, dichromats will be missing one of the cone types. If they're missing the longer wavelength cone, they are a protonope. If they're missing the middle wavelength cone, they're a deuteranope, and if they're missing the short wavelength cone, they're a tritonope. There are slight differences between how a protonope and a deuteranope see color, but they both roughly work out to having difficulty telling the difference between red and green. And so this is where we get the red-green color blindness. All forms of color deficiencies are pretty rare, with the most common being deuteranopia at about not quite 2% of the male population. Side note. This is a trait that's coded for on the X chromosome. So if you only get one copy from your mom and it's not a great copy, then you're going to have a color deficiency. But if you get two copies, so you have two X chromosomes, both copies need to not be normal in order for you to have a color deficiency. All right, so how does stuff look to a person with a color deficiency? Assuming you're a trichromat. If you're not seeing a difference between some of them, it may be worthwhile to play around with some of the online diagnostic tests linked in the description and possibly talking to your doctor. This is the color space as seen by a trichromat. This is a depiction of how it would look for a deuteranope, so missing the M type of cones. This is how it would look for somebody missing the L cones, so a protonope. And this is how it would look for somebody missing the S type cones, making them a tritonope. As shown, the deuteranope and protonope still have the ability to see blue normally, but the other colors are off. You can see how they would have trouble telling the difference between a Red Delicious and Granny Smith apple without labels. But the person missing the S cone is working with a completely different color space. I went to grad school with a tritonope, and the psychophysicist caught wind that there was somebody in their midst with a very rare color deficiency, and they practically kidnapped him. I say kidnapped, but he was on a paid research assistantship instead of a TA, so they could run no more than 20 hours of experiments a week on him, and he was reimbursed for it, so kidnapping is more dramatic. Anyways, this hopefully illustrates that most people who have some form of color deficiency aren't truly colorblind, 
They just experience the color world in a slightly different way. Another thing I need to talk about before we get to the fuzzballs is the distribution of rods and cones in the retina. The rods and cones aren't uniformly distributed. At the central point of our vision, called the fovea, the retina contains only cones. And it's not just that it's only cones, they are jam-packed in that region. As you move out from that central point, the density of cones decreases while the density of rods increases. A consequence of this, and some neural wiring details for another day, is that we have pretty detailed vision at the point we're focusing on, and the detail drops off as you move out from that focus. However, because rods are more sensitive to motion than cones, this means that we're better able to perceive motion out in the periphery than in central vision. Alright, last human thing. One of the structures in the eye is the choroid. This is a spongy, pigmented layer that essentially provides blood to the photoreceptors, but it also helps reduce light scatter inside the eye. The pigment of the choroid absorbs light that, for whatever reason, isn't being absorbed by the photoreceptors. If this scattered light wasn't absorbed, the image quality would be reduced as that light could potentially bounce around inside the eye before finally reaching the retina, but at that point wouldn't have a direct relationship to where it came from the outside visual scene. So, light enters the eye, has a chance to be absorbed by the photoreceptors of the retina, and if it gets through that without being absorbed, will hopefully be caught by the choroid. Cats have two cone types. It works out that their vision resembles that of a deuteranope, meaning a person missing the middle cone type. The distribution of rods and cones in the retina is different than what people have. These plots depict the photoreceptor densities of cats and humans. The cone plot is on the left, rod on the right. The horizontal axis is the angular displacement. Zero degrees is at the focal point of vision, and the displacement increases as we move out from that focal point. The vertical axis is the photoreceptor density per square millimeter. There is no cone-exclusive area of the cat's retina like there is in people. Even at the central point of vision, there are plenty of rods in the cat eye. Not quite as many as in the periphery, but there's still a fair bit. A consequence of this is that cats don't have as acute or finely detailed vision as people. However, they're better able to see in low light levels and better able at detecting motion than we are. Related to this distribution difference is that cats don't have a fovea. Instead, they have what's called the area centralis. Instead of a small circular region packed with photoreceptors, it's more of a streak. Do note that it's a horizontal streak. This gives better acuity along a horizontal axis rather than our point of high detail vision. And this is useful for spotting prey moving around along horizontal movement planes because of that relatively high rod density. But our little kitty friends have vertical slit pupils. What gives? Well, as talked about in the always brilliant True Facts series by Zay Frank, a recent paper put forward that small ambush predators, like house cats, can take advantage of some optics to better surprise their prey. The vertical slit pupil allows for the small cat's ability to find and determine distance to the thing being looked at. And now we're going to have a brief interlude where I consult with a physicist about how any of this makes sense optically. The physicist we are consulting with today is channel favorite Dr. Mr. The Husband, who you can probably figure out from that is my husband, and he's got a physics PhD. In motherfucking lasers and shit. Amongst other things. What benefit would vertical pupil slits provide? So there's two benefits that the paper outlines. One is an increased depth of field for vertical features like grass. And another is a shallower depth of field for horizontal features like the ground, which would allow you to see prey behind the grass or in grass and yet determine the distance on the ground in front of you. So let's expand a little bit on depth of field in case people watching aren't photography nuts. So depth of field is the distance both closer and farther away from the object that you focused on that is still in focus. Okay, so like when you're doing photography and let's say you're taking a picture of somebody and you have full control over stuff, you would want a more shallow depth of field so the person's in focus but the other stuff isn't to draw focus on that person and be more aesthetically pleasing. Right, and you would do that by increasing the aperture size in that case to the widest possible aperture so that your depth of field is the shortest. 
and then doing something like landscape photography where you want just everything in focus, you would have a much wider depth of field. Right, and you would close down your aperture really tight, as tight as the light would allow. So the tricky thing with the photography analogy is that camera lenses have basically a round aperture, and if we were to take that into eyeball terms, a round pupil. Cats don't. They have a vertical slit pupil. So what effect does that have on the depth of field? So a slit aperture will actually have two different depths of field for different orientated objects. So for vertical orientation, the depth of field is much wider. So for like grass, um, the distance that's in focus is much longer. And then for horizontal objects like the ground, the depth of field is very short. And that allows the cat to use a blur cue of the ground to determine distance of an object. And yet they can also find objects in a field of grass. So why do we see the vertical slit pupil in things like house cats or foxes, but not the bigger cats like lions and tigers and cheetahs and stuff? So the paper offers two theories on this. One is that short animals are more likely to be hunting in grass and short animals are more likely to have vertical slits. The other theory is that the taller the animal is, the less useful the blur cue is because you're actually looking down at the ground from a height rather than uh, forward across the ground. All right. Thank you for your time, Dr. Mr. The Husband. It was wonderful having you again. Yeah. Okay, moving on. The last feature I want to point out is the tapetum lucidum. So this is a structure that sits behind the retina and basically reflects light that wasn't absorbed by the photoreceptors the first time through. And this helps with vision in low light levels because the relatively scarce light, if it's not absorbed the first time, it passes by the photoreceptors. It gets a second chance when it's bounced forward by the tapetum lucidum surface. However, this does come at a cost as it does cause slightly blurrier vision because of the slight scattering that occurs. The tapetum lucidum sits between the retina and the choroid, which is the structure that helps reduce light scatter in addition to providing a blood supply. So light coming in has a chance to be absorbed by the photoreceptors of the retina, and then failing that has a chance to be bounced back past the retina from behind by the tapetum lucidum. If the light isn't absorbed at that point, it continues along its path. This is why cats have eye shine when a bright light is pointed at them. There's too much light to be caught effectively by the photoreceptors, so a good chunk of it is just shining right back out. Like cats, dogs have two cone types that results in color vision similar to that of a human deuterino. Also like cats, dogs have an area centralis rather than a fovea although the shape of this can vary between breeds. So, similar to cats, a dog's vision is going to be kind of blurry compared to our own. The dog hunting strategy, pre-domestication, wasn't to ambush prey quite like the proto-house cat. Instead, it was to exhaust the prey, just run it until it can't run anymore and then take it down. As such, there weren't quite the demands for having the exact distance to the prey item that the cats had. Dogs also have a tapetum lucidum to aid in lower light vision, and so can also have the laser eye effect. And that's a little bit about how some of our furry friends see the world. For more edutainment, you can do the YouTube dance, like, comment, subscribe. You can also catch me on Twitter, my Discord server, or Patreon. Links for those are in the description box. And yeah, see you guys in the next one. Bye! Thank you.